What's up, everybody? Welcome to our season two wrap up of Tuned. Now, sit down, this is gonna be a while, so pour yourself a pint of your favorite beverage, in my case, Dead Guy, if you're under 21. Pour yourself a pint of something else. First, let's talk about what is Tuned. It's about modified cars and about the stories behind modified cars. And we try and find good stories for you guys and we hope that we keep you entertained. Last season, our average horsepower rating per car was 581. Certainly nothing to sneeze at, but this season it felt more like the quest for more power. And we got it because our average horsepower this season was way up to 710. That is a big number, especially when you consider how many of our cars were actually right at six or 700 horsepower. So what we're gonna do here is go through every episode this season. I'm gonna tell you about my post episode thoughts, the things I've had time to reflect on, as well as answer some of the more popular questions that the fans had from each episode. Let's start with my personal favorite, the Hennessy Venom GT. By dropping the biggest engine available into a lightweight British Roadster, Carroll Shelby created one of the fastest, most terrifying supercars the world had ever seen. Now, 50 years later, another Texan has arrived, eager to make his mark on the supercar world. And though the Hennessy Venom GT Spider weighs just 15% more than the Cobra that inspired it, it makes 150% more horsepower. John Hennessy turns everything up to 11. I mean, really, how many people drive a Viper and then decide it needs twice the horsepower? Listen, the turbos just spool up. It's about power to weight, that's it. All right, let's do a little third gear roll on. <laughs> oh my God. It, it takes your breath away. There's pressure on your chest. You know, your, your head is in the seat. It's like every... <laughs> Oh my god, let's do that again. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> the Venom GT is uh, probably the most controversial car that we've driven, basically because A, of what Hennessy and his reputation is like, and B, the fact that it costs a million dollars and is registered as a Lotus. And a lot of people had problems with that. Now, on that note, uh, user uh, 300ZX Greg says, this car is still extremely overpriced. All the parts used to build this car, including the chassis, transmission, and engine, will not cost more than $150,000, including labor on an expensive day. I would like to point out that 300ZX Greg has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. If an automaker sold a car, any automaker, that only cost the sum of its parts, every car would cost nothing. I know for a fact that a Ferrari 360, when new, cost Ferrari no more than $40,000. Meanwhile, that car new in the US cost $160,000. That's four times what it cost Ferrari to build that car. Choose any car out there, especially an exotic sports car, and the math will be fairly similar. I know for a fact, every Venom GT built has $400,000 worth of parts in it and takes 5,000 man hours to build completely by hand. Factor in the development costs for the initial car amortized over every car sold, which is going to be a small volume even when maxed out, and that's where you get your money. Of course, there's profit margin built in, but everyone who builds something and sells it has a right to make a living. Now, let's check out our next video, the APR Audi TT RS. Anyone who knows Audis knows the name APR, and that's because they do it all, from ECU tunes to stage three turbo kits to full-on Grand Am racers. With this company, getting power is as simple as ordering an appetizer from a menu. Their facility feels as out of place as a ski resort in the South Pacific, a clean, modern mecca of German performance in the American Deep South. Practically everything they sell is designed and manufactured in-house from this building. They have outfitted this car with a stage three uh, turbo upgrade. And for that, you get obviously new manifolds, you get 
uh, intercooler stuff. You get uh, exhaust, uh, presumably some sort of high flow CAD system. And what that all adds up to is, and I kid you not here, 600 horsepower. 600 out of two and a half liters. And that's because the turbocharger they use is at 71 millimeters. So, let's see what happens when I put my foot in. No. Oh yeah, does it go. Wow. I, uh, I'm not gonna tell you how fast that was, because I'd probably go to jail, but it's, it's got the go juice, for sure. Now the story with the TTRS isn't so much about the car as it is about APR's amazing facility and the level of research that goes into their vehicles. I mean, APR is the only tuning company that I've ever heard of that does hot weather testing, cold weather testing, and altitude testing, and consequently their vehicles are known to be among the most durable tuner vehicles on the planet. Which is why I was so surprised that the TTRS makes nearly double the horsepower it made when it was stock. Yet, according to the owner, Steven, seems like a fully durable package you could drive every day for the life of the car and never have to do any additional maintenance. Driving the car itself was very, very nice actually, with a little bit of turbo lag, but you expect that with a small displacement turbo engine, but still some people had problems with it. For instance, Bouncier from YouTube says, the TT will always be a poor showman's Audi. Even with 6 million horsepower, you'll never be close to using this kind of power on real roads, and if you do, you're probably going to lose your license. And for the purposes of racetracks, there are much, much, much better cars with this price tag. All right, Bounceer, I will tell you this. I use that much power on a real road, and it is accessible. The all-wheel drive even made it accessible in the rain. Of course, they didn't launch the car as hard as it could be launched because it had a stock clutch still, and they asked me to be nice to it. That's just something that we do when someone asks you to be nice. But this car is legitimately very fast, and you can use the power on public roads. Can you go 160 miles an hour on a public road? Sure, you might go to jail, but that's the risk you run. Now, we didn't test the car on the track, but I have seen even stock TTRSs on the racetrack, and they are very, very quick. One of them was on One Lab of America and did extremely well, even for a car with only 340 horsepower. So I have no doubt that this car on a racetrack would be a pretty good sleeper car and would hands down beat a car like a Porsche Cayman R, a base Corvette, even possibly something like a Shelby GT500. That's just my opinion, but I am fully confident in APR's abilities, especially if they get into the suspension tuning in that car, which is what they're also known for. Now let's take a look at our next episode, the Hennessy Velociraptor 600. When I'm at it, <laughs> all hellfire breaks loose. And this is now the official ambassador to Mullet America. So the real question is this, why do you want to spend $16,000 on a Velociraptor. Well, it's dick measuring, right? It's my Raptor has more power than your Raptor. It's good to know that when you do it, you, there's not a whole lot of sacrifice. Once you write the check, probably get worse fuel economy because I'd have a hard time keeping my foot out of it. You'll hit 60 miles an hour a full second faster. You'll hit the quarter mile almost two seconds faster than stock. And if you're gonna be out there jumping dunes and racing your buddies, nice to know that your Raptor is faster than his Raptor. Velociraptor is close to home and the story is basically my relationship with the Raptor. Should I or should I not supercharge it from Hennessy? First, let's say this. We made several Hennessy films because in order for us to travel somewhere, we have to make multiple films because Hennessy tunes a wide variety of vehicles. It seemed only logical that while we were there and he had the cars there and he said, go at it, that we should film multiple vehicles. So with that being said, the Velociraptor 600 is an interesting package. It is feel stock when you're off the gas. It sacrifices virtually nothing except the initial uh, cost of the kit and it does zero to 60 in five and a half seconds tops out at 120 miles an hour and is just ridiculous <laughs> and, I, and I absolutely love it. It was fun. So most criticisms of this video are that, uh, let's see, hmm. 
Lincoln Lincoln from YouTube says, what do you need that power for? F***ing small d losers. <laughs> you need that power, Lincoln Lincoln, because it's awesome. And if you don't get it, you shouldn't be watching a show called Tuned. You are Over the course of that video, Zach tried to encourage me to get the kit because it wouldn't ruin the practicality of my current Raptor. And Chub B. Hong, who has a, just an awesome YouTube username, points out, LOL, Zach is an idiot. Obviously, all your gear is going to fit into the truck. Actually, Chub B. Hong is an idiot because he didn't remotely get the joke there. He, um, certifiable moron, that guy. Um, he, yeah, so LOL, Chub B. Hong is an idiot. In conclusion, I will say this. Some people also thought this kit was a ripoff at $14,000, but I will say this. Yes, you can get a supercharger for a Raptor and have a local shop put it on for less money. You can also go up the street and buy a handmade leather handbag for your wife that will probably be very nice. It might cost a few hundred dollars. You can also buy an Hermes bag, which will cost several thousand dollars. Is the Hermes bag any nicer than the other handmade leather bag? No, it isn't, but it's a brand, just like Hennessy is a brand. And if you buy a Hennessy vehicle, you're buying the product and you're buying that brand. And trust me, when you go to sell those two trucks down the road, which one's going to have more value? The Joe's Speed Shop modified truck or the Hennessy Velociraptor? My money goes to the Velociraptor. With that, let's take a look at our next video, the D3 Cadillac CTSV. In an effort to make the CTSV more interesting than people like me, D3 has done something that I wholeheartedly approve of added a shitload of horsepower. Let's see how that feels. <laughs> Traction may be an issue here. <laughs> Let's go to manual mode. But they also want to customize it to the owner's taste for what they want to do with the car. This owner daily drives the car, but he also races it competitively in the Cadillac Challenge series, which is a time attack series. So, in order to back up all that power and keep things under control, they upgraded the brakes. There's a two-piece Brembo floating caliper now up front, and they've upgraded the discs as well to cross-drilled vented two-piece discs. The D3 CTSV was the first car that I drove this season that I didn't love. And it's not that they did a bad job with the car, it's just that we ran into an issue that we run into with some builds in, in different occasions, which is that I thought we were going to drive one of their crazy wide-body cars, like you've seen at car shows. Turns out those cars are not street legal, so they gave us a customer's car. The problem with a customer's car is that it's tuned to the way the customer wants it. And this particular customer started with a daily driver and turned it into a track car, which is fine if that's what you want to do, but it had an automatic transmission, uh, he took out the magnetic ride control and put in coilovers, so it was very low and very stiff, and it was very loud. Um, and that's, that, that's all well and good for the track, but I was driving it on the street. And there's a difference between a track car, which is designed to be driven at 10 tenths, and driving a, an enthusiast street car, which is more like 8 tenths. So we ran into that issue, and the car was stiff, low, loud. And so I asked the question, could this car be a sleeper? And almost universally, uh, people said no. For example, uh, Pieter Moore says, is that a sleeper? F no, it's loud as hell and hammered to the ground. Might be a sleeper to a mid-30s soccer mom driving her kids around, but not to anyone else. I think people misunderstood me here. I think if you hear the car, obviously it's not a sleeper. If you examine it very closely, obviously it's not a sleeper. But if you hear a lot of sleepers or examine sleepers closely, you can tell they're not sleepers. The point is if the car is sitting there parked, not running, it looks like a sleeper. If you just glance over, you might know it's a V, but you don't know it's a slammed 750 horsepower V that is way faster than most other CTSVs you could drive. So that was what I was getting at, and a lot of people got angry about it. Some people agreed with me, but the other thing that people, uh, that we learned about this car was the automatic transmission. And I complained a lot about the automatic transmission. But later in the series, when I drove the Hennessy Camaro ZL1, which we'll get to in a minute, it had the same automatic transmission. The difference is, because I didn't complain about the ZL1, is the transmission tuning. This transmission was tuned for two things. Be lazy and drive, and be crazy on the track. 
nothing in between. So for the enthusiast driving, it didn't shift like I wanted to shift. Sometimes it's the hardware and sometimes it's the software. In this case, it was the software. But that being said, let's move on to our next video, the electric DMC DeLorean. Torque my way out of corners very nicely. The electric motor in this car makes 230 horsepower and 240 pounds of torque, which is actually not bad. It's almost twice the torque the original car made and about 100 horsepower more than the original, but it does carry around about 300 pounds of extra weight. And you feel it through the steering, if not through the engine. And if you thought the Camaro required a gangster lean position, you've never been in a DeLorean because I feel like I'm in a Formula One seat right now with how far I'm laying down. It's also a prototype and therefore does not have air conditioning. So this tiny little window here, that's all you get. The good news is I can still drive with the doors open if I ever want a freshy fresh breeze. And actually <laughs> quite prefer that. When we review a car, I tend to do my in-car talking first and then drive around so we get the exterior shots and the mounted shots and stuff like that. Usually that takes 70 to 100 miles of driving. With this electric DeLorean, that created a situation that people like to refer to as range anxiety. And I had no idea how much juice this thing had in it, how far it would go. It was very hot out, and I was stopping, starting, turning around, all the things we do in a car. And <laughs> what you don't see in the video is that this car almost died right before it made it back to the, to the shop. We barely, barely made it back. And so this battery in this thing went from full to very nearly dead in about 75 miles. Granted, it's a prototype, but still, I would like a little more range out of that for my electric DeLorean. Some people had some comments on that. Uh, who took Gammon uh, says, the acceleration was kind of underwhelming. It didn't look like five seconds to 60 at all. Um, and I actually tend to agree with him. I think one of the things you have to deal with with an electric car is the gearing. Do you want a higher top speed? Do you want faster acceleration? Because with a car like this, you only get one gear, so you can't have both. The, the RPMs of the, of the motor are limited. So, when they originally timed that, there was a shorter gear in the car for acceleration. Between then and when I drove the car, they put in a longer gear for higher top speed and to keep the RPMs lower on the highway. Consequently, the acceleration was significantly slower than actually 5 seconds to 60, and I would say it was more like 7 or 8 seconds to 60. I'm hoping that by the time this car goes to production, if it ever gets there, that situation gets worked out. But I continue my quest, and I will not give up until I finally find a DeLorean worth driving. Let's move on to our next film, the Hennessy ZL1. I can drive around like this all I want, and the car's gonna hold up. It's gonna start when I need it to start. And if I'm gonna buy a $55,000 ZL1 Camaro, put another 20 into it with Hennessy for all the upgrades, you know, I'm 75 grand into a car. That car had better start when I want it to start. That was only 4,000 RPM, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna, I need it to be reliable. I need it to get me where I want to go. And the good news is this package comes with a three-year, 36,000-mile warranty. So if it breaks, it's on him, not you. This car was so loud that I, I, for the first time in my entire life, I actually felt guilty driving it past people's houses for the uh, drive-by shots. I mean, this car would wake the freaking dead. It idled loud, it, it, it revved loud. Everything about this car was loud and obnoxious. And that's fun, but I, I hate to say it, I would tone it down <laughs> just a little bit if it was my personal car. It was an absolute animal, but it made the power for sure. Now, um, we had a drag race between myself in the ZL1 and John Hennessy in his uh, hammer wagon. And uh, To The Floor Videos commented, no times or a mile per hour in the quarter mile, lame. And actually, we are gonna cop to that. That was our fault. We should have posted the times and we were so obsessed with the pretty driving footage, we honestly forgot. So here are the times for the drag race, which we recorded. Uh, the ZL1, and mind you, this was a 90 degree day, uh, just about sea level street tires. The ZL1 ran an 11.2 at 129 miles an hour and the CTSV ran an 11.08 at 132 miles an hour. 
Uh, and both cars are capable of running about 10.7 when you put street legal drag radials on them as opposed to Michelin Pilot Sports. Either way, low 11s, high 10s is extremely fast for a car like this and uh, uh, hooking them up off the line is where you're going to make up or lose the time. The ZL1 with traction control off is extremely difficult to hook up, but once it got going, man did it get going. And uh, what a brilliant automobile. One more comment is Bismillah Mashala, who says, I don't consider 20 grand for 100 horsepower worth it. That's fine. They've sold literally 50 of those packages already, so 50 people do think it's worth it. Furthermore, you get upgraded sway bars, it's a full exhaust, it's a transmission tune, it's heads, it's cams. This isn't just a, a blower pulley and a tune here. This is actual hot rodding hardware that's going into that car. Factor in the cost to labor, uh, the cost of labor to install it, and of course the brand, and uh, that's where your 20 grand comes from. Let's, uh, let's check out our next video, the 900 horsepower Hefner Twin Turbo Lamborghini Gallardo. In an unassuming warehouse surrounded by a pond, trees, and industrial buildings not worth a second glance, you'll find the workshop of the first person to add two turbos to a Lamborghini. His name is Jason Hefner, and his shop doesn't need a sign because his cars speak for themselves. <laughs> This car operates at seven pounds of boost and makes roughly 800 horsepower at the wheels, which equates to close to 950 horsepower at the flywheel. I want to say in about 2003, we moved from superchargers to turbo systems, quickly realized that it was, it was obviously the way to go. Now that you've experienced the sights and sounds of the Hefner Twin Turbo Gallardo, let me show you what it's like right here to uh, do a pull. This was a very cool car. Uh, 900 horsepower, all-wheel drive, otherwise stock. Um, and uh, what's great about this car is that it can handle this power stock. Now, some people, and I'm referring to Rider32 is true, says, uh, the, tune, the tune videos are really good, but I don't understand why they choose to test cars with less horsepower than others. For instance, they're driving a 900 horsepower Hefner when they could test a 1500 horsepower underground racing. They chose to test an 800 horsepower GTR when they could be testing a 1200 or 1500 horsepower GTR. <laughs> you have no idea what 900 horsepower feels like, do you? Uh, you're just someone who watches YouTube videos and assumes that all cars should be in the four-digit horsepower, and if they're not, then they're not cool. What you don't understand is this. I know underground racing makes a 1,500-horsepower car because Hefner also makes a 1,500-horsepower car. You can actually see it in the background of the video. It's the gray Superleggera, but it was in a million pieces. When we have to make these videos, we schedule them. We schedule them around our schedule. We schedule them around their schedule. Not only was the 900 horsepower car the only vehicle available for us to test on that particular day, it's also Hefner's volume seller. So when the tuners want to promote a car through us, they want to promote their volume product. They want to promote what they're known for. And the best thing about the 900 horsepower package is it's a bolt-on package for a stock bottom end. The 1500 horsepower kit requires a full engine rebuild, full transmission rebuild, and very few people actually buy those. And so that's why we drove this car, because we wanted to see if it was streetable, um, if it was uh, well-behaved. And speaking of well-behaved, some of you very, very, have, have really good ears and pointed out that it sounded like the clutch was slipping a little in between gear shifts. Part of that is that there is a little slip built in to this package in the software. Another part of it is that Jason was planning on replacing the clutch because the owner takes this thing to the track a lot and, uh, and the clutch has had 26,000 miles on it, on the original clutch, and he wanted to let me kick the crap out of it before he gave it back to the customer with a freshy fresh clutch. So good for you, good ears uh, on, on hearing that little bit of clutch slip. It's halfway between programmed and actually slipping. <laughs> uh, but it's all fixed up, the car is good to go, and back in the customer's hands. Let's move to our next, oh, let's do one more. Nicholas Shaw 96 says, the arm hair is gross, Matt. 
I'm Arab. Deal with it. Uh, next video. <laughs> the Titan Motorsports 700 horsepower restored and modified Toyota Supra. Titan knows Supras. One look around the shop can tell you that. From mild street tunes, bodywork and restorations, all the way to the six second world's fastest Supra, Titan has truly figured out how to make the most of the 2JZ engine. Their built drag motors push 2,400 horsepower from just three liters and can be overnighted around the world so their customers are always ready to race. Today, it's time to remind ourselves of what it's like to actually drive a tastefully modified Supra. It doesn't have 1,200 horsepower, but it's set up right, and for that, I'm thankful. Titan is uh, just about as professional a shop as they come. Their lobby is full of trophies. Uh, they've got everything they need, race cars, street cars, everything from uh, relatively mild builds to full-on you know, 2,500 horsepower madness. And they were great guys, and I really liked having them. Um, I enjoyed the car too. I related it a bit to my Corvette. A lot of things that uh, people didn't know about this car. In 1997, all Supras were actually Targa roofs, and this one was converted to a full hardtop. Someone pointed that out, but it is actually a real 97 with a hardtop conversion. Some people didn't like the Recaro back seats, uh, but I thought they were kind of funny, even though you couldn't actually fit anyone back there. But great example of a really clean, well-balanced, and well-preserved build. I, I, if every Supra was like that, I mean, God, would that be great. And it really made me appreciate the Supra because the only one I'd ever driven before was 1,100 horsepower and it was terrible. 700 is a great, great number for, uh, for those cars. And they're, I mean, ridiculously fast in the street. Make no mistake, that's a fast, fast car. Uh, let's see, Eat My Dust 1311 who is a regular commenter on uh, all of our videos. We've, we've gotten into it a couple times. We see eye to eye on other things. Uh, says, Matt, everything considered, is this a better car than your Corvette, considering they're from the same time period? And how much does the upgrade cost? Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know actually how much they've got into this car. There's a lot of custom work that goes on there. Um, there's suspension and brakes and, and all kinds of stuff. I think you can get 700 horsepower in a Supra for about $10,000, which is really not bad. Um, the stock bottom end, stock long block in this car, the engine had never been rebuilt, which is why the stock cam seal went uh, when I started driving it because he honestly keeps his car in a garage and rarely drives it so it probably got driven harder by me than it's been driven in the last five or six years. Um, fortunately they were able to fix it up. But to get to your question, I prefer my Corvette. I think that my Corvette is a better balanced vehicle. Um, it's lighter by about 500 pounds. Um, it handles better. It's lower and wider. Um, I like the low-end torque of the V8. Um, even though I don't have as much top end power as the Supra does, the, the lighter weight does make up for it. Um, and I, I do prefer my Corvette to the Supra. The Supra, you can make them handle good, you really can't make them handle great, at least as far as I've seen. You know, Titan or any of these other guys will tell you that you can drive a Supra on a road course with a properly set up suspension. And I believe that. But at the end of the day, I don't think it would be as fun or as balanced on a road course uh, as my Corvette is. It's a great straight line car and it can go around corners respectably, but at the end of the day I think that uh, the Corvette is a better all around sports car than the Supra. Um, the Supra makes a better drag car though, so there you go. And Kheron93 says, would it not be possible to install a second turbo that works at lower RPM so there's less lag? These Supras originally came with a twin turbo setup and those were sequential turbos for less lag at the bottom end. The problem is when you want more power, you have to put in a bigger turbo, which takes up space in the engine, so there's a, not a lot of room left to do it. Now there are some twin turbo kits, including some that are really big power. They're just more complicated, they're more expensive, and uh, it's not really a very common uh, upgrade for the car. But yes, it is possible to do that, even though not very many people actually go for it. Let's take a look at our next video, a car I really enjoyed, the Rentec CLS 63. You got a five and a half liter bi-turbo engine, hand-built by AMG. They've added 20% uh, larger Garrett ball bearing turbochargers, software, downpipes, and high flow cats. That's it. And for that, you get 700 crank horsepower, 600 wheel horsepower. <laughs> and this is in a car that holds four people and is currently giving me a fully cooled butt massage. Automatic, it's in sixth gear right now, Sport Plus. A thousand RPM, drop three gears. Jesus. 
We're gonna go. It's, it's seriously, seriously fast. That's brilliant. The Giggle Dino says that this is making 700 horsepower. The Giggle don't lie. You know, you can read dino sheets all day long, but if I don't laugh, it ain't making the power. It's making the power. This is a really, really neat car. It's a four seat sedan. Uh, that has all the luxury features you'd expect from a stock $120,000 AMG car, all the safety features you'd want, and oh, by the way, it runs a 10 second quarter mile and can do burnouts uh, at 60 miles an hour. I love that. I think it's great. I, and it's not, it's loud when you get on it, but it's not too loud. Uh, it can be civilized, and even though uh, the suspension has been lowered by an inch, it actually rides fine on all but the roughest of pavement. Um, however, the black identity disagrees. It says it's a completely pointless car and only good for burning the tires. I think he's missing the point here. The point of the car is that if you turn traction control all the way off and mat it, yes, it will burn the tires. However, if you leave the traction control on and drive like a normal human being, not like someone who's testing the car on video, it, it drives fine. It drives like almost like a stock CLS. It's a little bit louder. But besides that, it's as good a luxury car as any stock CLS is, with the exception of a very, very little bit of ride quality. But, I mean, this is <laughs> 10 seconds. Ten, the, the, the Camaro ZL1 we tested, which is a, a dedicated sports car, runs a 10.7. That's what this thing runs, and it's 300 pounds heavier and is a German luxury car. I mean... Where else are you going to find something like that? That is crazy. And this kit isn't even done yet. It's a development package, which is why I can't answer Daniel and Gren's question, which is how much does it cost? The answer is they don't know yet because they're not done with the package and they haven't finalized the production parts. Hopefully, by the end of this year, we'll know. And also, hopefully, by the end of this year, Hartmut will have achieved his goal of running in the nine-second range in that car, which should be thoroughly unbelievable. Uh, but... I love that shop, I love that guy, and, uh, and that car is really, really amazing. Let's move on to something with really big power, the 1100 horsepower Schweitzer Ultimate Street Edition Nissan GTR. What's your favorite thing about the GTR in general? In general, launching it. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to launch it, so, 1000 horsepower launch, here we go. <laughs> wow, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> That's why people drive 1,000 horsepower GTRs, to do that. All right, well, the launch is properly crazy. Let's see what happens when I have grip. I'll do a second gear roll on here. That was pretty impressive. Let's let's try it again. Before we get to a question about this car, I do have something to say about GTRs in general. They are boring. Uh, they are insanely capable, and if you're uh, recording lap times, they will put up lap times with the best of them. They will make any driver look like a rock star, and for that reason, I don't like them. Um, I'd rather a car that is more involved and that feels more special. The GTR to me doesn't feel very special. And I think the fact that so many people are willing to go huge power in their GTRs are, really just shows how unspecial they are. To sit in a GTR, maybe for five minutes feels special, but when you get used to it, it's, it's just a Nissan. You get into a McLaren, you get into a Ferrari, you get into a Porsche, just sitting in it feels like you're in something special. The GTR doesn't feel like that. To drive it around the street at low speeds doesn't feel like that. A Ferrari 458 feels special at five miles an hour. A GTR does not. It only feels special when you're flying, which is why I think so many people need this much power in their GTRs because they drive them for a week or two, they no longer feel special, and they need more and more power, more and more power. And for evidence of this, know that the owner of this particular vehicle 
had just gotten his car back two months ago with 1,100 horsepower on race gas, mind you, and already wants more power. He said he wants to take it back and go for 1,400 horsepower. How boring does a car have to be that 1,000 horsepower still doesn't make it exciting enough? So while the Schweitzer kit is amazing and puts down in a straight line ridiculous numbers, and I'll get to those in a second, at the end of the day, the car, unless you're launching it, unless you're on a runway, unless you got enough road to go really fast, it just doesn't feel that special, doesn't sound that special, and it doesn't drive all that special. However, uh, X Instant Classic 17X says, Hey Farah, what do you reckon the 0 to 60 would be on this car? It's about 2.2 seconds, which is ridiculous. And uh, Bad With Names 123 says, What is the 0 to 200 kilometer time? I have no idea. The Stocks GTR does 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds. This is much down lower, and that's with uh, drag slicks. But I do know that this car will run 210 miles an hour in the standing mile, which is about 35 miles an hour faster than a stock GTR. Anyone who knows anything about standing mile racing knows how much power you need to get a number like that. And the answer is a ton. So, with that said, let's move on to our final video of the season. The double header, double feature, Turner Motorsports M3 streetcar and race car. Okay, I'm pretty sure there's heat in the tires now. I have no traction control. But according to Will, I have a really badass ABS system. Wow, those brakes. Once you get some heat in them, those are some ridiculous brakes. This car weighs uh, 3,310 pounds. With a, fuel, a full tank of fuel, it's actually barely lighter than the street car. I'm trying to think of statistics right now, but all I'm thinking is go faster and don't die. With the Turner video, we got away from chasing big horsepower numbers and focused on balance. Now, balance is something that's really important in a car, especially in a race car. And so I got to drive the, uh, the Frozen M3 street car and their Continental GS series race car. Now, uh, Brendan Wargo on YouTube says, great video like always, I have a question. Has driving these cars changed my outlook on how I want to modify my Corvette? No, actually, because my Corvette was always built with balance in mind. As we drove these huge horsepower cars, I started to think, maybe my Corvette isn't fast enough. Maybe I need a supercharger. Maybe I need twin turbos. But then I got back in my Corvette and drove it and said, you know what? My car is perfect. And that's exactly how I felt driving the Frozen Gray M3. Everything from engine, brakes, suspension, chassis, tires, seats, all in harmony. And that's what you really want. And that's what I love about the Turner M3 and that's what I love about my Corvette. It's got enough power to have a really good time in, and it's got enough suspension and brakes to keep everything under control, and that's what I want in my own personal modified car. I don't need a zillion horsepower, because when I drive my car, it's not for people on YouTube, it's for me to enjoy. Um, a couple people, including 333PG333, commented that I was not driving the race car fast enough. And you know what, they have a point. However, let me tell you this. For weeks leading up to this film, Will Turner called me and said, Matt, I'm happy to have you drive my car, but it has to race three days after you drive it, and if you screw up, I'm going to kill you. Um, I have never driven on slicks before. The track was damp, and I had only 30 minutes in the car. Usually I get to drive a car first, get a feel for it, and then start filming. This one, no. In the car, cameras on, go from zero. And there is nothing worse, and I mean, with the exception of death, or maybe getting butt raped, there's nothing worse than crashing someone else's race car that you have spent six months begging them to let you drive. And so uh, I decided to err on the side of caution, experience the car, have a good time, see what my first real race car is like, but not push it beyond where I felt comfortable, especially with a gigantic camera rig uh, directly in front of my face obstructing half the view and while trying to talk the, uh, the entire time. There's a lot of things going on there, a lot of intimidation there. And most importantly, because I didn't crash the race car or spin out or do any damage to it, it's going to lead to more opportunities in race cars. 
The key to getting into race cars is to not crash the first race car. So that was my goal, and that was our season of Tuned. Which brings me to a point. Um, Ganoy, or G-N-O-Y 26, says, Every time I come to Tuned, it's about horsepower, turbos, superchargers. Tuning has the widest scope to any aspect of modification, and week after week, it's just about power, power, and ugh, more boring power. What about understanding downforce, handling, build quality, and basically everything within our grasp? Well, I hope with the Turner videos at the end, we covered some of that, as this comment was a little older. But let me just say this. We make an entertainment show. Furthermore, we make an on-demand entertainment show. While, yes, we will be focusing on more custom work, different stuff that's not just big horsepower for major shops, at the end of the day, horsepower sells uh, when you're making on-demand video content. So next season, we're going to try and do something a little different. Rather than go to big-name shops, and drive their demo vehicles, we're gonna look for more custom one-off builds. Stuff like the Blastoline, or like owner's cars that they've built themselves. With that in mind, if you guys have a car you'd like to see on Tuned, and you, you must know the owner of this car if you are not the owner of this car, email us at tunedatthesmokingtire.com. We begin filming our next season very shortly, and I'm interested in getting your modified car on it, provided it's actually cool and not a piece of crap. Until then, I'm Matt Farah. Hope you've enjoyed Season 2 of Tuned. And while you're waiting for Season 3, you want to see more from me and the guys, the different stuff we like to do, the podcast, the tweets, the writing, the other videos, come to thesmokingtire.com. I'll be waiting for you with a pint of dead guy. Tom? All done, Farah. 40 minutes in about an hour 15. 40 minutes. Season 3. Ah.